Thank you. Could I, first of all, welcome you to Emmanuel. My name is Stuart Gill. I'm the principal here. Acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, and I'm sure we'd all agree that this is uh, a wonderful part of the, the land as we look out uh, over the, the river here. And I would like to pay our respects to elders past and present. This is a second uh, in a series that uh, we started uh, earlier this year. Um, our council decided uh, last year, uh, having had connection with the Faraday Institute at the University of Cambridge uh, for some time, initially through Sir Brian Heap and then through some other members of that, uh, that group, that we should start a, a little centre for the study of uh, science, religion, and in society, and I'm very pleased that, that, that John has agreed to be the second speaker. Uh, my co-conspirator in this was Ross McKenzie, Professor Ross McKenzie, and he sends his apologies today because I think he is involved in teaching in Sri Lanka and India at the moment. Well, global warming is, of course, a hot topic today. It's generated uh, much interest, debate, argument, and conjecture, particularly in the media. And uh, I was hoping that, uh, well, we might have some skeptics uh, in, in the audience, but I was, uh, I was hoping that some of my council members might be here today, who I know are died in wool skeptics, and we might get a little bit of uh, debate going. But it receives, it seems, daily media attention. Some scientists have stood by the evidence that proves global warming, while others have got rather hot under the collar uh, in attempts to convince us otherwise. But the debate, of course, has uh, extended beyond scientists, and I think John uh, has been involved in, in, in part of this uh, uh, popularization that has taken place uh, as well. <coughs> the scientific process, I think, should always be open to healthy skepticism and the data should be able to stand up to scrutiny by the global scientific community. <coughs> Non-scientists, as I say, have got into the discussion and often let off a lot of steam. There's much misinformation and misconception. We might say there's a lot of hot air. Uh, certainly not this morning. Uh, there's not much hot air uh, at all. Um, this has often led to a lot of confusion and misunderstanding, and I'm pleased that our speaker today, John Cook, has spent much of his recent career examining the arguments of the global warming sceptics. In the talk today, he's going to speak about climate change, and yes, there are, it seems, some weightier matters that touch on the subject of social justice. <coughs> The Old Testament scholar Carl Dempsey wrote as long ago as 2000 in her book Hope Amid Ruins, the planet and all its inhabitants and life forms are suffering in a large part because some members of the human community have violated their right relationship with creation, tipped the balance and acted unjustly and unethically. When read in contemporary socio-ecological context, the texts of the prophets offer readers a disturbing picture that calls for an ethical response that can no longer be avoided. The prophets call for social justice, although in a different time and context, calls us, and especially those of us who are Christians, or approach the world from a faith perspective, where God is creator, to re-examine our own actions on other human beings and on the natural world. John, we look forward to your perspective uh, on this in your talk. And uh, I don't want to take time up by uh, introducing you. I think much has been said in the flyer already. But it's great to have you with us today. And we look forward to what you're going to share. Thank you. Please go John. Thank you. Thanks, Stuart. And, and thanks for the invitation to talk at Emmanuel. Uh, many, many years ago, I um, Actually, I live next door to here at uh, King's College, and I was about to mention that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and Still keep the students on site. Well, well, the fact that um, a manual next door was a co-ed college meant that I often came over here to visit as well. So, so it's good to be back. Now, uh, what I'm going to um, present today, or I'm going to I'm going to offer 
a Christian view on climate change. Now, there's a scene in The Simpsons where the judge issues a restraining order um, that, that orders that our religion and science have to maintain a 500 yard distance from each other at all times. So, so I'm just warning ahead of time that I'm going to be breaking that restraining order uh, during today's talk. Now, I run a website, Skeptical Science, which is basically a, a catalogue of climate myths. So some people collect stamps, I collect misinformation. And, and what we've been doing over the last uh, number of years is gradually building up this database of climate misinformation and investigating what the peer-reviewed science says about each of these climate myths. And what I've noticed as we've gradually built the database up and, and started to step back and look at the, look at the patterns is, is we've seen several patterns in the climate myths and, and also uh, patterns within climate science itself. And although climate science is it's huge, it's complicated, it's, it's, there's a lot to take in, uh, essentially there's, there's really just five key points that you need to understand, that you need to know um, in order to I guess, know whether to act on climate change. And I'll just go through these briefly. Now, the first, the first fact is that global warming is happening now. So, so we have many lines of evidence that tell us that, that our planet is building up heat. And even though I think last night was, was I think it was the coldest night in five years or something in Brisbane, um, it's, it's called global warming, not Brisbane warming. And, and overall, our planet is warming. Now, the next important fact is that, that humans are causing the warming. And, and I'm going to go into how we know that shortly. And, and flowing on from that, you know, is that, the important fact to know is that the impacts from this warming that we're causing are serious. Impacts on the environment and impacts on humanity and society. Now, climate scientists agree about these first three facts. So what we have is a, a scientific consensus among the climate science community about, about this science. And lastly, you know, the fact that humans are the cause of the problem, it also means that we can be the solution. And we have all the technology we need now to be able to fix it. Now, I'm going to go in a little bit uh, more detail about these points because there's one theme across all five of them which I think it's important to understand. And that's that our understanding of what's happening to our climate isn't based on a single line of evidence, but it's based on many different independent lines of evidence. Now, climate science isn't like a house of cards where if you take one card out, the whole thing comes tumbling down. It's more like a jigsaw puzzle where we're gradually adding in more pieces and as we add in more pieces, we get a clearer picture of what's happening to our climate. And, and what we see in terms of the question of is global warming happening, is we see, uh, I guess we have thermometers that measure global warming, but we also have natural thermometers, other indications of weather warming is happening. And we see that all through our climate. We see ice sheets uh, crumbling, we see sea ice is uh, declining glaciers are shrinking, animal species are shifting towards cooler regions, either towards the poles or up mountains where it's cooler. Um, even tree lines are shifting. And, and animal species are also mating earlier in the year. And it's, it's not because they're getting randier, it's actually because the, the seasons are actually shifting and spring is coming earlier every year. Now, uh, there's, I think uh, over time, with more talks I've given, I've learned that the number of graphs I give in, in my talks is directly proportional to the number of yawns I see towards the end of the talk. So, so I'm going to talk about uh, warming, but I'm going to restrict myself to just looking at this one graph because I think that this, more than, more than any other graph, uh, tells a vivid story of what's happening to our planet. Now what this is, is um, adding up all the heat content in our climate system. And there's a few features that jump out immediately when you look at it. Um, the first thing it tells us is that more than 90% of global warming is going into the oceans. So that's the big blue area, is, is all this heat building up and warming our oceans. Now, the little red strip down the bottom, that's uh, the amount of heat going into 
warming the land, warming the atmosphere, and melting the ice. Now the other thing that, um, the important feature of this graph is, if you look on the y-axis, you see how much heat our planet has been building up. And it's about 200 by 10 to the power of 21 joules, which is 200 with 21 zeros behind it. Now, most people, other than extreme physics nerds, wouldn't really know what that means. But to put it in a way that we understand, it's equivalent to, um, over the last 50 years, I'm seeing some smiles, is, is there some physics nerds that do understand what that means, is there? Anyway, um, what it means is over the last 50 years, our planet has been building up heat at a rate of about two, two to three Hiroshima bombs per second. So that means that in the time it takes me to say this sentence, our planet has um, built up about 20 Hiroshima bombs worth of energy. So our planet is building up a lot of heat. So all this build-up of energy <coughs> manifests itself all throughout our climate, and that's why we see all these different signs of warming. So then the question is, how do we know that humans are causing it? And the reason we know is because our fingerprints can be observed all over our climate. So again, there's not just one line of evidence that says that humans are the cause. There's many independent lines, different measurements done in completely different ways that are all pointing to the same answer. Now, I'm going to quickly look at two of them. Now, what, what greenhouse warming is, what global warming is about, is our carbon emissions, our carbon dioxide emissions in the atmosphere are trapping heat. So if, if heat's getting trapped by CO2, that means that there's less heat escaping out of space. So that means that if you have satellites out in space measuring the amount of heat coming up from the Earth, they should, over the last few decades, be measuring less and less heat escaping out of space. <coughs> now that's what satellites have been doing. When scientists look at satellite measurements over the last decade and compare it to satellite measurements from the 1970s, what they find is less heat escaping the space at the exact wavelengths that greenhouse gases absorb energy. Now the scientists who did this analysis concluded that this was direct experimental evidence for a significant increase in the Earth's greenhouse effect. Now, if less heat is escaping out of space, that means that there should be more heat returning back to the Earth's surface. And so we can measure that as well. And so what scientists have done is taken surface measurements of heat coming back down from the atmosphere, and what they found was, again, more heat returning to Earth at those exact wavelengths that greenhouse gases absorb energy. Now the scientists who did this analysis concluded in 2006 that this experimental data should effectively end the argument by skeptics that no experimental evidence exists for the connection between greenhouse gas increases in the atmosphere and global warming. Now, it kind of seemed almost naively optimistic, uh, this kind of statement from the scientists, because I guess they couldn't really have foreseen just a human capacity to deny evidence that, that people find inconvenient. So, following on from the fact that humans are, are causing global warming, uh, we also understand that the impacts of climate change are serious on, on the environment and on humans and on society. And I'm going to look at a few of them and just explain, explain how it happens. Now, as it gets warmer, what we see is more evaporation. And more evaporation means more water vapour in the atmosphere. Now, over the last 50 years, uh, the amount of water vapour up in the air has increased by about 4%, and that's equivalent to about 900 um, Sydney harbours worth of water. Um, that usually works for Australian audiences. Everything's measured in uh, Sydney harbours when we're talking about big, big amounts of liquid. I think during the Brisbane floods, they were always talking about how many Sydney harbours were coming through Brisbane. Now, because there's all this extra water vapour in the air, well, what goes up must come back down again. And so what we're seeing is, over time, there's been an increase in the number of weather-related floods. We're seeing more heavy downpours, and therefore more flooding disasters. Now, now compare that to the number of non-weather-related disasters, such as earthquakes, which slightly increased maybe because of our ability to detect them um, better. 
but the number of floods are increasing at a much greater rate. And that's because, because there's more water vapour in the air driving these heavy downpours. Now the flip side of this um, more flooding caused by evaporation is also when you get more evaporation, it dries out the ground. And, and what that is causing is more intense drought and more intense dry areas. So globally, the um, amount of dry areas or drought-stricken areas across the globe has increased by about 10% over the last 60 years. So we're seeing at the same time more flooding, and, but also more drought. And, and this isn't just predictions models, this is actual observations. And one of the most, most serious impacts on humanity will be sea level rise. Now what this um, graph shows are projections of sea level rise over this century up to 2100. And there's a, there's a couple of interesting features of this graph that I'd just like to quickly go into. Now the first thing is note the AR4, there's, there's three little lines towards the bottom right corner of the graph. Now what this is, is where the predictions from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC, back in 2007. Now, they predicted sea level rise at the end of the century of about 40 centimetres. Is that 40? Yeah, 40 centimetres. And they basically um, came, came up with this figure by assuming that ice sheets, melting ice sheets, would not really contribute that much to sea level rise over, over the next century, over this century. And since, since 2007, what we've been seeing is the ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica uh, losing ice mass at an accelerating rate. About 20 years ago, Greenland was, was roughly in mass balance. So the amount of ice building up in the middle of Greenland was balanced by the amount of ice that it was losing around the edges. Now, 10 years ago, Greenland was losing about 100 billion tonnes of ice. So, so to put that into perspective, imagine an ice cube that uh, is a kilometre high, a kilometre wide and a kilometre deep, which is a, the, the Empire State Building is about 250 metres high. So imagine four times higher than that and, and a cube that big. That's one billion tonnes of ice. So Greenland is losing 100 billion tonnes. Now that was 10 years ago. Currently, Greenland is losing 300 billion tonnes of ice. So the amount of ice loss from Greenland is accelerating. Now, because of, because of, of the latest science, uh, the, the coloured areas show the updated predictions of sea level rise based on the latest science. And what they find is, taking into account the, the uh, melting ice sheets, that we're going to see probably around a metre sea level rise by the end of the year. Uh, by, the end of the, by the end of this century. Now, th this is significant because uh, most of the human population lives around the coastline, and, and sea level rise has the potential to displace hundreds of millions of people. And the other important thing that jumps out at me about this graph is that typically the IPCC finish everything at 2100, but obviously uh, our grandchildren are going to be living on past 2100 and sea level rise is still going up at quite a steep rate at that point. So, so where are we headed in the long term? Now, a key to where, what the future is going to be like can be found in the past. Now, when we look at what our Earth was like 120,000 years ago, um, basically, global temperatures were about one degree warmer than now. Now, one degree warming is about the most optimistic scenario you get from all the various IPCC projections. So that's, that's the best case scenario where we aggressively work hard to reduce our emissions. Now, when, when the Earth was one degree warmer than now, <coughs> sea levels were at least five metres higher than they are now. And what happened was Greenland and Antarctica lost significant portions of their ice mass that melted and, and that rose sea levels. So, so what, the, what the past tells us is that our ice sheets are very sensitive to, to sustained higher temperatures. And it also tells us that, that one degree of warming might not seem like much in terms of during the day we experience big shifts in temperature, but globally that adds up to a lot of heat. Now, all these climate impacts all have uh, a, a very ironic um, 
uh, result. And that's the, now what this, what this picture shows is in the top half of the graph we see the how much countries are emitting carbon dioxide. So the red countries, uh, particularly in North America and, and towards the, the top of, I guess, Europe and, and Asia, is countries that are emitting a lot of carbon dioxide. There's also that little island in the bottom red corner. Yeah. So now down the bottom, it talks about which countries are most impacted by, um, by climate change. And what we see is the countries who have emitted the least amount of carbon dioxide pollution are the ones that are most affected by climate change. Now the other, just to exacerbate this irony, um, what, what we also have is the countries who are most impacted are also the least able to adapt. So what this means is climate change isn't just an environmental issue, it's a social justice issue. And when it's countries that are the most, um, the, the countries that are the least uh, contributing to the problem are the ones who are uh, being most affected. And when it's countries like Australia that are contributing the most pollution who are affecting these countries, that's, that's where we have to start contemplating the, the justice aspect of climate change. Now, so we have, have these three um, key scientific points that warming is happening, we're causing it, and, and the impacts are serious. And basically we have this consensus of evidence, we have these many lines of evidence establishing these facts. And the follow-on from this consensus of evidence is that we have a consensus among climate scientists, and all, the, all uh, an overwhelming scientific consensus that humans are causing global warming. Now I'll just, I'll just look at this briefly as well. Now there's been several studies of several surveys of the climate science community uh, using different methods uh, trying to ascertain just how many climate scientists agree that humans are causing global warming. And, and the two latest surveys in 2009-2010 both found the same result, which is that around 97 out of 100 climate scientists, the climate experts who are, who are publishing, actively publishing climate research agree that humans are causing global warming. Now, the consensus also manifests in other ways as well, not just among the climate science community. A, a number of um, prestigious scientific organisations also endorse the consensus. Yeah, so we have academies of science from all over the world endorsing the consensus, but we also have major scientific organisations like NASA, the National Oceanic um, and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, and the Royal Society of the UK, all endorsing that humans are causing global warming. And lastly, we find a consensus in the peer-reviewed research. So, so this is a survey that was done by Naomi Oreskes in 2004, where she looked at all the papers, about 930 of them, uh, that, that were about global climate change, and over 1993 to 2003. And what she found was about a quarter of them explicitly endorsed the consensus. About half of them were about impacts and mitigation, which implicitly endorsed the consensus. And about another quarter of them were about methods or, or about um, paleoclimate, which didn't address the question of whether humans were causing global warming. And so they were neutral papers. But what she found was there were no papers that rejected the consensus. Now, she was very clear to say that this doesn't mean that there are zero um, rejection papers in existence, but taking a sample of a thousand papers and finding, finding no rejection papers, even if you broaden that to a, a bigger sample, the, the amount of papers that reject the consensus are, are negligible. And so uh, climate scepticism in the peer-reviewed literature has had negligible influence on our understanding of the climate. So, so the scientists agree about what's happening to our climate. And, and a key, um, I guess the consequence of this is not, I guess, you know, usually when I give this talk, it, it's gotten so depressing by this point, that, but it, it is important to note that there is, there is hope. Like we have, even though we've caused this problem, we, we can, um, being the source of the problem, we can also um, be the solution. And I guess the key thing to remember is that we have all the technology we need to to transition our society from a, a carbon fossil fuel based society 
to a clean, renewable society. So all the technology is there. The only thing that's missing is, is the political will and the public will. Now, uh, so I'm going to change tack now. And now, while over the last few years, while I've been investigating science and, and really grappling with the impacts of climate change, and, and particularly that social justice aspect where the developing countries that have contributed the least were the most impacted. At the same time, I was doing a, um, a Bible study with some friends at my church and, and my pastor, and we came, up, came to a chapter about social justice and what was the biblical view on social justice. And we started by looking at the parable of the sheep and goats in Matthew 25. Now, this is the only picture I could find on Google Images with our sheep and goats, and it's very cute and cuddly, but the parable of sheep and goats is not quite so cute and cuddly as the picture. Yeah, because it's a, it's a parable that Jesus uh, told, which painted the picture of Judgment Day and what happens there. And basically, all of humanity are divided into two groups, the sheep and the goats. And, and simply put, the, the one group, um, the group who, who cared for the poor, who fed them, who gave them shelter, clothes, and healed them, they were rewarded. And the other group, who ignored the poor and the needy, they were judged. And I don't want to get into kind of the, the deeper theological aspects of, of this parable because it, it can get quite heavy. But the take home for me, the, the one uh, important fact, is that um, care for the poor and, and social justice are defining characteristics of Christians. And, and this is what I think Jesus was saying in this parable. Now we then moved on to um, a passage just a couple of chapters earlier in Matthew where Jesus is having a run-in with the religious leaders of the time and he gives them quite a serve and he, he says to them woe to you scribes and Pharisees hypocrites for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law justice and mercy and faith these you ought to have done without leaving the others undone and what, what Jesus is saying here is that, and also in the parable of the sheep and goats, is that justice and mercy and faith are core Christian values. And, and that, um, yeah, that social justice is something that God cares about and that he expects us to care about. Now, I found this quite challenging, these passages. And then we started going to the Old Testament. Now, often the New Testament can be quite warm and fuzzy compared to the Old Testament. And I found that that was the case too, because we went into um, the book of Amos in chapter 5, and here God is um, examining what, what the, um, the society was like at the time, and he characterises it like this. You trample the poor, stealing their grain through taxes and unfair rent. You oppress good people by taking bribes and deprive the poor of justice in the courts. Now, he's talking about God's people here, the Israelites. And this is what God thinks of, of a society that, that tolerates and, and promotes injustice. He says, I hate all your show and pretense, the hypocrisy of your religious festivals and solemn assemblies. Away with your noisy hymns of praise. I will not listen to, your, to the music of your harps. Now, the new international version, which was the, the translation um, of, that my Bible is, it worded this even stronger. It said, your assemblies are a stench to me. And, and this, um, that phrase just ran through my head for um, weeks after reading it. And just thinking about what type of Christians does God want us to be. Now, there are a number of our Christian groups that um, basically take this theme of social justice and apply it to climate change. And one of them is the Evangelical Climate Initiative, which is a group of um, around 300 <coughs> evangelical leaders in the United States. And basically they say, uh, well, in the first part of this, they talk about, about how climate change affects the poor, re reiterating the stuff that I was talking about earlier. But then they go on to talk about, and it gets a bit cut off here, but they talk on about what is the Christian uh, obligation in light of this. And they say that because the, the two great commandments are love God and love our neighbours. And because we're called to love our neighbours, Christians must care about climate change 
is a conclusion they come to. Now, interestingly though, there are, there are other Christian groups that come to a different conclusion. And there's one called the Cornwall Alliance uh, in the US. And basically they come to the conclusion that when we shouldn't do anything about climate change. And interestingly, one of the reasons they uh, give for this is because they say that if we do, if we institute climate policies, this is going to harm the poor. So it's, it's kind of funny that we have two different types of climate groups, both addressing the issue of climate change, both holding these Christian values of, of justice and, and helping the poor, but they come to completely opposite conclusions. So how can this group come to this conclusion? And the answer, uh, you can find it in this statement, uh, the, the key is here, because they conclude that human activity has negligible influence on global temperature, and they conclude that the influence is not dangerous. So basically, they're rejecting what climate science is telling us is happening to our climate change. Now, now why do they do that? And, and basically the key here, and there's been a number of studies that have looked at what affects people's <coughs> attitudes towards climate change, and through a number of studies, a, a clear picture is emerging that the, the strongest influencer of, of people's attitudes about climate change <coughs> is actually political ideology. So we look at this graph here and we see that as you get more towards the conservative end of the spectrum, um, people become more skeptical that humans are causing global warming, or even that global warming is happening. How does ideology affect um, our scientific attitudes when science should have nothing to do with politics? And, and the way, the process that drives this is confirmation bias. So if you're presented with mixed evidence, some of it is confirming what you believe and some of it is conflicting with what you believe, what confirmation bias does is you, know, you focus on, and you place much greater weight on the evidence that confirms your belief and you suppress or reject or ignore any evidence that conflicts with your belief. Now, so th this confirmation bias, um, you can see it through, through many of the um, climate myths that I've been um, building up over the years and, and this is one of the patterns that I've observed in, in building this catalogue of climate myths. Now, now what I found was you can, you can group these climate myths into five different techniques um, or I guess they're characteristics of, of, um, of denial of, of any scientific consensus. So it doesn't just apply to climate change but it applies to any movement that denies a, a scientific consensus. And, and what these techniques or characteristics are are basically rhetorical arguments that, that give the impression that there is still an ongoing debate when actually the scientists have, uh, are no longer debating like the science has been settled. And I'll just, um, I'll just list these and then we'll look at some examples of them. Now the first one is fake experts. And that's um, uh, raising up spokespeople who aren't actually qualified in, in the science or in climate science, but nevertheless give the impression that they're, they're experts. And what this does is, is give people uh, the impression that there's still an ongoing debate in the scientific community. Now the next one is cherry picking. Now we've seen that there's many different lines of evidence for, for global, human cause of global warming. But if, if all the evidence is, uh, goes against what we want to believe, then one way to get around that is just to uh, ignore the evidence you don't like and just pick out the little bits of evidence that that paint the picture that, that you want to paint. Now the next one is logical fallacies. And this is employing logical arguments that, that have a fallacy that leads you to a wrong conclusion. And I'll, I'll give an example that kind of makes that a bit more concrete shortly. Now, now another technique is impossible expectations, which is either raising the level of proof required to, a, to an unattainable standard or shifting the focus away from what we know to areas of uncertainty. And lastly, conspiracy theories. So if all the scientists are agreeing and you don't like what they're agreeing about, then 
then obviously they must all be engaged in some kind of conspiracy. So I'm going to um, use the Cornwall Alliance Declaration about climate change to demonstrate these um, five techniques. Because if you read through their declaration and, and you have those five techniques uh, sitting next to it, you basically tick them off as you go through. In fact, there's a lot of ticks. So firstly, if there's a consensus, if, if all the scientists agree, how, how can you um, portray the impression that, that there is still a debate among the scientific community? And the answer is, produce a group of fake experts that, that aren't qualified in climate science, but give the impression that they are qualified. So the Cornwall Alliance, um, here's a quote from their declaration where they say that global warming allows alarmism falsely claims overwhelming scientific consensus in favour of the hypothesis of dangerous man-made warming, ignoring tens of thousands of scientists who disagree. Now, when they talk about tens of thousands of scientists, what they're referring to is the petition project, which is this um, petition on the internet that has 31,000 scientists have signed up, uh, agreeing with a uh, statement that there's no evidence that humans are causing uh, that humans are disrupting our climate. Now, if, if there's a scientific consensus, if 97% of climate scientists agree, how, how can we have 31,000 scientists disagreeing? Right? How, do you, how do you marry those two ideas? And the answer is that when you look at all the names on this list, what you find is that 99.9% .9 of them are not climate scientists. Basically, anyone with a science degree is qualified to sign this petition. So what you find are medical doctors, computer scientists, uh, engineers, but very few climate scientists. So this is basically fake experts in bulk. And this is a technique that's not even original. Um, the, the tobacco industry perfected this idea of, of parading tens of thousands of scientists back in the 1970s. So, so it's just a, it's an old idea and an effective idea which continues to be used today. Now, an, the second technique um, of, of science denial is logical fallacies. And I'm just going to pick one example because um, this example is actually the number one climate myth that, that I've ever encountered. Like we, we keep track of how many times these myths occur and this one um, has been at the top of the list for a while now. Now the fallacy here is non sequitur. Now I did physics, not um, Latin or classics, but, but um, Google tells me that what that means is it does not follow. And basically it applies to a logical fallacy where, where you have a, a premise and you have your conclusion, but the premise doesn't lead to the conclusion. Um, the conclusion isn't supported by the premise. And the most popular uh, example of this fallacy is the argument that climate change has happened in the past, so therefore today's climate change must be natural as well. And, and a whole section in the Cornwall Declaration is, is basically arguing that, that, that recent current global warming is, is just a natural cycle and, and there's always been natural cycles throughout Earth's past. Now this is, this is like, I guess the logical fallacy here, it's the same logic as just imagine finding a, um, a dead body with a, a smoking gun wound in the body and looking at that and thinking, well, people have died of natural causes throughout all of Earth's history, so this guy must have died of natural causes as well. The, the logic doesn't follow from the premise to the conclusion. <coughs> so what does past climate change tell us? What, I, what I'm showing here, which is a little bit covered up, is a graph of temperature over the last half a million years of, of Earth's temperature. And, and what we see is big changes in temperature, five, um, around five degrees of global warming. And we already saw that one degree can make a big difference in terms of sea level rise. Five degrees is the difference between what we, our current warm conditions and an ice age. Now, when we look over the last half a million years, we see this, this regular cycle of, of around a thousand years we go from a, a warm period down into an ice age. 
Now, does anyone here know what drives that 100,000 year cycle? Now, we do have a uh, lead author of the IPCC in the room. Does he know what drives it? Milankovitch cycle. Okay, and what are those? Uh, Can you say it for the layperson? Wobble, wobble in the Earth's uh, uh, spin and orientation as it goes around the Earth. Okay, uh, 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 <laughs> all right, you pass the test, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, basically, changes in the Earth's orbit are driving these 100,000 year cycles, these dramatic changes from warm periods right down into an ice age. Now changes in the Earth's orbit only has, have a very small and subtle and slow. But what happens is, is our climate re, um, have all these reinforcing feedbacks which magnify the smallest, smallest nudges from the, the orbital changes. And this, this is the key lesson from past climate change, that when when we give our climate just the smallest nudge, it, um, it changes dramatically. But what we're currently doing now is we're not just giving it a small nudge, we're giving it a big, a big push. Now, this bottom graph shows, it's basically a measure of how much heat our planet is um, building up over time. And it's been fairly flat for the last 2,000 years, but when the Industrial Revolution came in and we started putting all these greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, then our planet started building up heat and, then, and our planet, planet started um, yeah, accumulating heat. Now the top graph shows temperature over the last 2,000 years and it basically follows that there's, there's been climate changes over the last 2,000 years, but once the planet started building up this heat, temperature started uh, rising dramatically as well. And so the, the lesson from past climate change is that when you give give climate a push, it reacts dramatically. That reinforcing feedbacks kick in and 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 have a big change in temperature. So past climate change isn't a cause for for um, for calm. It's actually a cause for concern. Now the next um, technique of science denial is impossible expectations, and this can be. Um, Raising the level of proof to like absolute certainty, which is impossible in science. It's not how science operates. Or it can be just uh, ignoring all the things that we do know and just focusing on the uncertainties. And and the key thing to realise about uncertainty in science is that uncertainty is not always our friend. Now this graph shows model predictions of. What, how Arctic sea ice was, was projected to behave over the, over the next few decades. And basically the red line is what actually happened. And, and reality dipped below the worst case predictions um, within, a, within a few decades. And basically scientists are saying that what's happening in the Arctic is several decades ahead of schedule. It's happening much faster than, than we expected. And this is a case where uncertainty is, is not our friend, that climate is actually predicting, uh, is reacting a lot faster than we anticipate. Now we see this also with sea level rise. Now the, that grey bar there is again the range of projected values of how sea level is expected to rise over the next few decades. Over the next, yeah, and, and basically the blue line there is observations. And and reality is tracking at the very top, at the worst case scenario of, of our model predictions. So, so while there is an uncertainty range with our models, that doesn't mean that everything is going to be hunky-dory. It can mean that it actually can, um, the uncertainty can actually end up with, with observations being at the, the worst <coughs> end of um, our predictions. Now this is how the Cornwall Alliance treat models and uncertainty. They say that um, predicting the future of the climate system is so complex a task that it might never be achieved. While it may be possible to adjust or fit a model to mimic past climatic conditions, this does not guarantee that the processes causing climate change are ac accurately portrayed. Now basically what they're doing is throwing up their hands and saying, we can't do it, uh, um, we'll never do it. We, we can't know what's going to happen to our climate. And the logic behind this we should wait for absolute certainty before we act. It's a bit like 
if someone said to you, the, by, by treating this poison, the, the possible range of effects are either you'll get slightly sick or you might die. And, but keep drinking the poison until we narrow the uncertainty range. The other irony of, of this uncertainty argument is that while the, while the Cornwall Alliance are heavily focused on uncertainty, they're also very certain that humans are not causing global warming, and they're dead certain that we should not act on climate change. And in fact, they're so certain that any evidence that goes against, um, or any evidence for human-caused climate change is uh, immediately rejected. And that brings me to the next um, denial technique, which is cherry picking. So this is basically looking for that little bit of evidence that backs up what you want to believe, and then ignoring all the other evidence. So let me give one example of cherry picking from the Cornwall Alliance Declaration. Although it's actually flattery to call this cherry picking, because they basically state that there is no evidence that humans are causing global warming. Now, we've already seen that there's, there's many different lines of evidence, empirical, direct measurements, that humans are causing global warming. So how can they say, state unequivocally that there's no evidence that, that humans are causing it? And this takes me to the, the final um, denial technique, which, well, I won't give it away, but um, if, if all the science and all the climate scientists agree on the science, but you don't like what they're agreeing on, then there's one last thing you can do to, um, to counter that, and that's to assume that all the climate scientists are in on a conspiracy theory. <laughs> worked, worked hard on those little moustaches last night, <laughs> so I'm glad I got a few laughs. Now, um, so there's, there's several, there's a spectrum of different levels of conspiracy theory, and they range from the tinfoil hat wearing extreme end where climate scientists are secretly conspiring with some shadowy group that's trying to take over the world. And then there's the more subtle form of conspiracy theory. And, and this is how the, the Cornwall Alliance um, state theirs, which is that if scientists are promised a career of financial support to find evidence of man-made climate change, they will do their best to find it. Basically they're saying scientists are in it for the money and they're skewing or they're falsifying their, their conclusions um, for financial reasons. Now, there are two distinctive tra uh, traits of conspiracy theories. And the first one is that conspiracy theorists uh, ascribe nearly omnipotent power to the conspirators. So, if, somebody, if somebody's coming up with a conspiracy theory that is so broad, that is so, um, you know, so many people are involved in it. The, the larger this conspiracy gets, the more implausible it is that the conspiracy is ever, you know, that it manages to stay secret. So, yeah, so that's a warning signal when people start to um, uh, come up with conspiracies that are just so broad in scope. Now, let's look at this, this idea of, um, of, you know, could, could climate scientists be falsifying evidence of, of man-made climate change? Now, if you take that to its ultimate conclusion, what you would have to find is the scientists who, who analyze the satellite data to find less heat escape in the space, they must have uh, falsified those results. And then the, a completely separate team using different data to find that more heat is returning to Earth, they too must have falsified their data. Now, there's other human fingerprints found both in satellite measurements and in weather balloon measurements that find that the upper atmosphere is cooling while the lower atmosphere is warming, which is a fingerprint of greenhouse warming. So somehow the, sat the satellites and the weather balloons, they must have got to as well. Now, the temperature record, the surface temperature record, also shows these other patterns of greenhouse warming, which is that winters are warming faster than summers, nights are warming faster than days, and you see this in temperature records from England, Europe, Japan, America, so involving thousands of scientists. So the conspiracy is just getting bigger and bigger in this, this effort to falsify human-caused global warming. 
and, and it goes on and on as we look at, at more of the evidence. Now, there's a, there's a saying that um, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So to make such an extraordinary claim that the whole climate science community is falsifying their data would require extraordinary evidence. Now, <coughs> now climate skeptics thought they found their evidence um, when all these emails were stolen from climate scientists' computers back in 2009. And, but since those emails were um, stolen, there's been nine separate inquiries, both in England and America, uh, held by government, held by universities, um, that have gone through all these emails and interviewed the, the scientists involved, and all of them have concluded that there was no evidence of wrongdoing by the climate scientists. So, so that brings me to the second trait of conspiracy theorists, and that's that any evidence against a conspiracy, to a conspiracy theorist, this is proof of the conspiracy. So basically every investigation that came out and said, there's nothing in those emails, there's climate scientists aren't doing anything wrong. Basically the response of climate skeptics was, aha, proof, that's a whitewash, proof of the conspiracy. And basically any evidence against the conspiracy, or, or conspiracy theorists are basically immune to evidence. Now, where are we? That's right. Now, it's the interesting thing is the author, the lead author of the Cornwall Alliance chapter on science is Roy Spencer, who is a climate scientist from the University of, Hunts, uh, of Alabama, Alabama in Huntsville. And I, I, I find it, well, I, I find it extraordinary that a climate scientist would be saying this about his colleagues and, and publishing, publishing these, um, this misinformation. And so, I mean, you have to wonder why, why would um, a climate scientist um, say these kinds of things? And I think an insight into why can be found in, in the statement that he made about, about how he views his own work. He says that, I view my job a little like a legislator, supported by the taxpayer, to protect the interests of the taxpayer and to minimise the role of government. Now, ideology biases how people process evidence. So I find it intensely disappointing that a Christian organisation is publishing this misinformation and promoting it to the Christian community. And I find it especially disappointing because climate change, um, the, the church doesn't have to run from this issue. It, there is actually an opportunity for the church to be a leader in this issue. Uh, now, now let me give an example. Uh, a few years ago, someone posted a comment on my website uh, basically questioning what were my motives in doing sceptical science. Was I getting paid by that, that secret organisation that are trying to take over the world? And so I saw this as an opportunity to explain why I care about climate change. And so I talked about my, um, my Christian faith. All right. I, I also started with this cartoon just to say that this is not why I ran Skeptical Science, which was because once you start arguing with people on the internet, you just can't stop doing it. But um, yeah, so I basically explained my Christian faith and how, and also the fact that I was a parent. And so my motivations were concern for the world that I was giving to my child, and also uh, concern about, about the issues of, of justice and mercy. Which, which I saw as core Christian values. Now there was quite a um, strong reaction to this article and uh, Christians seemed to react quite positively. Atheists were a bit more ambivalent about it, but, um, but yeah, it was, it was interesting. And the strongest response actually came from the, the UK newspaper, The Guardian, who wrote uh, this, an article about, about my um, post. Now the heading's not that doesn't seem that flattering. Why would a solar physicist embrace the non-rationality of religion? <laughs> but, but as you read through it, uh, and obviously, I, I mean, he does seem to have a bit of a, um, an ambivalent attitude towards Christianity as well. But he concluded, uh, well, I guess, no, let's go back. The, the good thing about this article was it gave me the opportunity 
to talk about my faith and talk about how God cares about the poor and the needy and he expects us to. And so he and so the article concluded by I guess examining the the um, examining when when what happens when our faith informs our actions, when we, we we practice what we preach, I guess. And so so what this um, taught me this this whole experience taught me a few things. And so so, so in conclusion, uh, again, I, I don't think that climate change is something that the Christians and the church should run away from. It actually should be seen as an opportunity. Now, my experience with the Guardian article opened my eyes to the fact that it's an opportunity for us to put our faith into action. And there's no more eloquent witness than deeds that back up our words. Now, it also gives us, the church, the opportunity to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. And the church should not be tolerating misinformation, and we certainly shouldn't be promoting it. And lastly, it's an opportunity for the church to actually be a shining light on the hill and pointing our communities to the core Christian values of justice and mercy. Okay, thank you.